Never ever hold your breath. Always come up slow and never dive alone. The three major rules in scuba diving. What's up guys, it's Brian again from Lake Hickory Scuba Marina. If you are new to our channel, do me a huge favor real quick. Hit this little subscribe button right here and ding that little bell as well. That way you guys will be notified every time we upload new content. Now it's another cold winter morning. It was 34 degrees when I woke up this morning. It was just above freezing. And we're going to go out and we are going to do something that your open water instructor probably told you you shouldn't be doing. And that is we're going solo diving. Now solo diving is kind of one of those things in the industry that a lot of people don't want to talk about they kind of see that it's a dangerous uh, thing to do and they really preach especially in the open water program do not do always dive with a buddy and at the end of the day that is true you should always dive with a buddy there are certain circumstances though where solo diving can be extremely safe as long as you have four things you need the proper knowledge the proper skills the proper equipment and the proper experience and you can solo dive safely. Now, what we're gonna do in this video is we're gonna look at the anatomy of a solo dive, what you have to do to prepare to go solo diving, and then I'm gonna kinda commentate through an actual solo dive and, and let you know what's going on in my mind during the dive itself and the things that I'm thinking of. Now, there's two aspects to solo diving I wanna break down real quick. The first is the professional aspect, and then the second is the aspect of you actually going out and diving by yourself with no one else around. The professional aspect is something that all dive professionals experience, whether you're a dive master or you're a full-fledged instructor. When you have a group of divers that you're looking after, whether you're teaching them, they're students or whatnot, your job is to teach them how to look after themselves and their buddy, and they learn certain skill sets to assist their buddy during an emergency. But they're still learning, they're students. So at the end of the day, what what happens if something happens to you? Who is there to look after you as that dive professional? So at some point in time, you kind of got to realize as a dive professional, you are a solo diver. Whether you got a certification for it or not, you're actually a solo diver. You have to look after not only your students, but you also have to look after yourself. So the independent diver course from SSI is a great course, not just for someone who's wanting to solo dive, but it's a great course for even that dive professional who needs that skill set because more more than likely he's going to end up by himself at some point in time. Now the second aspect that I want to talk about is actually planning. This is where the anatomy of a solo dive comes in and we're going to look at all the steps that I went through to plan the dive that I'm going to make today and break it down so that you guys can see solo diving is really not that dangerous as long as you got the proper knowledge, the skills, the equipment, and the experience. So with that being said, let's head down to the lake and let's get wet. All right, guys, before we continue with the video, I want to make a quick disclaimer. Please do not use this video as training for you to go out here and go solo diving. You need to seek out a solo diving instructor so that you can get trained properly before you go out and do this. Yes, I am a solo diving instructor, but I'm not your solo diving instructor. You need to get up with your local SSI training center and let them teach you how to do this in whatever environment you're going to be in. Now, with that disclaimer kind of out of the way, let's talk about what I've got to uh, do while I'm out here and the whole purpose of the dive not the purpose of the video but the purpose of the dive here behind me is our training grounds if you've ever took classes from us and you did your dives here in the lake you'll know what these training grounds are that little orange ball that's floating out there right there that is one of our training platforms and there's tons of objects out here that are sunk it's kind of like a quarry even though it's an open lake there's plenty of items uh, for divers to see and there's ropes going to everything well the purpose of this dive is for me to go out inspect the training grounds make sure all the ropes are still tied up make sure the little navigation cards that we've got on the ropes uh, that help lead divers when they're under there make sure that they're still good that they don't need to be fixed or whatnot and then even get some of the fish hooks out of the ropes as well i also want to check the condition of the water and i'll kind of talk about that when we're underwater as well and so i need to do it today and i need to do it early today because if we look over here behind me there's a boat access and that boat access right there is full of pickup trucks. That means there's a fishing tournament going on today and I really want to get out here before all them boats are up on the water stirring it up and then of course causing a hazard for me as well. So I definitely got to have a flag when I'm out here. But the most important thing that I can talk about before I get wet is following a dive plan and you need to follow a dive plan 
with three places or with three different people. First of all, always follow your dive plan on the site. So here on the site, there will be a dive plan written of exactly what I'm doing and the purposes of this dive. I'm gonna follow it with my wife, who is the closest person to me. And then I'm also gonna follow it with another diver who is kind of my equal here. And the cool thing about doing that, my wife, the best she can do is dial 911 if something happens, but this other diver can actually get in the water, come out and locate me if an emergency happens. How will they know if an emergency happens is because because during that dive plan or on that dive plan, I've stated this is when I'm going to get in the water. This is when I'm going to get out. And if you've not had contact from me by this time, then you know something's wrong. You need to come look for me. So the first thing that you want to do and probably the most important thing to do, of course, is file a dive plan. Since we've done that, we're going to head up here, put some gear on, and we're going to go diving. All right guys, so I'm just now getting my dry suit on and I wanna talk a little bit about why I chose to dive a dry suit today and why I chose the specific one that I'm diving. Typically in colder environments, I like to dive a dry suit. It's a lot more comfortable and it makes the dive more enjoyable in general. However, I like my neoprene dry suit the best. It's very comfortable, it's very stretchy, gives me plenty of warmth and I don't have to wear a lot of bulky undergarments with it. However, there is a downside to my neoprene dry suit. One, it's a back entry zip. So once I have it on, I can't really zip it and unzip it by myself. And so I've got to have a buddy for it. Well, since we're doing solo diving today, I don't have a buddy. The suit that I chose today is the Scuba Force Expedition. And it's one of my newer dry suits. And there's a couple of reasons I actually chose it. One, it's a front entry. So once I have this guy on, I can zip it or unzip it by myself. I don't need a buddy. The other reason I chose this suit is it specifically has a P-valve attached. And if you're not familiar what a P-valve is, it's a device that allows you to relieve yourself when you're underwater because obviously you don't wanna to go to the bathroom in your dry suit like you can in a wetsuit. But with this one, since I have a P-valve attached then or installed, obviously I can relieve myself if I need to during this dive. Now there's several ways that we can attach a P-valve. We're not really gonna get into that in this video. There are special devices for female divers and there's special devices for male divers. For male divers, we basically have to wear a condom catheter. So in the true Ferris Bueller style, so now with that out of the way, I'm gonna finish getting gear up. I've got one more gear check to do here on land. I'm gonna do a bubble check in the water and then we're going solo diving. So if you wonder real quick why I'm looking so goofy here, well, first of all, that's just the way I look. But I'm actually using my camera here as my makeshift buddy to make sure that my mask and everything else is properly fitted before I get in the water. Now I'm gonna go ahead and walk my tanks down into the entry area and I'm gonna do a quick test in the water or do a bubble test in the water in very, very shallow water so that I'm not having to do it, say, down at 10, 15, or even 20 foot deep. So here you can see I'm actually doing my uh, bubble check and all I did was just turn both tanks on. I'm gonna lay it down in the water and I'm looking to see if there's any bubbles. I'm gonna take my time here, get my fins on, get my tanks attached and just doing one final gear check. And I know this is the third gear check I've done, but when you go solo diving, you need to be very meticulous like this and make sure everything's in good, proper working order. Cause the last thing that you want is to have a problem underwater and your dive buddy not be there to assist you. So I'm just taking my time, getting everything in place, making sure I got plenty of air, just once again, being very meticulous with my dive checks before I submerge myself underwater. Now, as I stated at the beginning of this video too, please don't use this video as your personal training video. You need to seek out the training of your local SSI independent diving instructor and make sure that you're getting properly trained before you go out here and do this. Yes, this can be safe, but it's more, it's gonna be more dangerous if you're not properly trained um, before you get out there and do that. Now I've got my dial flag. I did one final check there on my flashlight and I'm gonna go ahead and make my descent. And I'm just gonna do a slow descent following a sloping bottom until I get over to the main line that leads you out to our playground area. And there's several things that I'm doing here that I've got to keep in mind. One, I don't want to create an entanglement hazard with uh, the line to my float. Number two, I need to be able to make sure that I can get to both 
of my air sources. In this case, I'm in side mount, so I need to be able to uh, switch regs and do gas switches and things like that. And I need to just make sure that I can maintain neutral buoyancy throughout this dive as well. So there's a lot of things that's going on that I've got to focus on, but if you take it slow and you've got the proper knowledge, skills, equipment, experience, you can do this very safely as well. Now, the things that you're seeing, those jelly balls that you're seeing here on these lines, these are pretty cool. These are called Bryzoans. And back about a year ago, I got challenged or got re-challenged on the uh, Critter Hunter Challenge to find Bryzoans in our lake. And I've just not had time to shoot that video. I'm going to be using some of the footage from this video for an upcoming video where we talk about the ecology of these Bryzoans and what they actually are. And this time of the year, they are all over our lake. So it's it's going to be pretty cool to be able to use some of the same footage for a future video as well. But as I'm swimming along, the first thing that I'm going to come to on this line is what we call the junction sea -doo or the vertical sea -doo. And basically, it's just a sea -doo that is standing straight up and down. And we use it as a junction point to determine where it is that we're wanting to go. And so you'll see that there's one line that, that comes from the docks, goes straight into this vertical sea -doo, And then you'll notice there's three lines that leave and go off the opposite end. I'm actually going to take that bottom line there, or the one to the far right, because it's going to lead me over to the deeper section first. And obviously, I want to do the deepest part of my dive first. And my plan here is to get down to about 60 feet and check some of the street signs that are at 60 feet that we've kind of installed. Um, you will notice there's an umbrella rig there. If you're a fisherman, you'll understand what that is. Basically, it's uh, the purpose of it is to kind of resemble a school of fish, and it, it's a good little lure that you can catch bass and uh, stripers and larger largemouth and things like that with. But I'm going to go ahead and get it um, unstuck from the rope here and since i've not went too far from the sea yet i'm gonna actually swim right back over to the sea and temporarily put it there until i can get back to it towards the end of the dive and that way i'm just not having to carry it around and i don't have to worry about that that hazard as i'm swimming around so you'll see i'll swim right back over to the sea real quick and i'm just going to kind of secure it there and any other trash that i find now i'm not going to be picking up bottles and everything else but things like that if it could endanger a diver I'm definitely going to be getting it out of the line. Most of the time, we have to kind of pry out the hooks on the line, but that one was pretty easy to do. Now, I'm going to pick up my flag again, and I'm going to continue on down. And we are going to work over to one of the sunken satellite dishes that's in the lake. And if you remember the 70s and 80s, we had these big, big, huge satellite dishes. That's what I'm actually headed over to now. We've got several that sunk here in the lake, and you'll see there's plenty of those Bryzoans everywhere. But these satellite dishes create really good structures for fish to come in, create beds and things like that. We usually have some pretty large catfish that hang out around them. But I'm just checking the ropes, making sure the ropes are tied up, make sure they're secure, make sure they're not cut or broke or anything like that. Because, like I said, our divers use these ropes to go from structure to structure. Right now, like I said, there are a ton of Bryzoans all over them, so I'm just actually going to leave them on there. They're kind of fun to bounce around with underwater, but you don't really want to da damage them. They are a living organism. And the cool thing about Bryzoans, they let us know that we have a healthy eco or healthy water system because that's the only place they really grow in is healthy water systems so even though our lake's kind of stingy the bryzoans tell us that we are we do have healthy water now this next object that we're coming up to this is one of our main platforms um, and it's kind of the central hub of our training grounds if you will so i could have went if i would have took that middle rope from the sea it would have led me straight here but like i said i took the deep rope first went over to the satellite dish and then worked over to the platform now, I'm going to briefly go over to our smaller platform. This is what we use when we're uh, going through and we're doing navigational runs with students. So they'll, they'll take a heading from the first platform over to the second platform and then kind of vice versa. But the reason I'm doing this is because I can branch off and I can head down to the deeper sections where we've got several boats sunk. So that's what I'm going to do now. <clears throat> now, keep in mind... I've got several things going through my mind. Not only am I down here doing inspection of all these items and making sure the ropes are good, I'm also checking to make sure the little tags, there you'll see one of the tags that we put on there, and it's just a piece of slate. I'm making sure that everything is still, um, you know, readable that the the people can see it and know where they're headed and things like that. But I'm also trying to keep t track of my time, my depth, my buoyancy, and keeping track of my gas switches is too because i need to know when to switch from one tank to the next and obviously if i'm in side mount i can either do that based off time or i can do it based off 
um, how much pressure is in each tank, which is typically what I do. And if you've seen my videos in the past on side mount, you'll know how often I make a switch. Now we're over at what's called the deep uh, sailboat. This is one of the first uh, deeper uh, sections in our little training grounds. And it's not very deep. I think I'm 25, 30 foot deep, something like that here. But it's not very deep, but it does lead on down to the deeper sections. So as I head on to the stern of this vessel here, one thing that you'll notice is that big old pile of rope right there. You'll notice it's been cut. I'm actually going to have to divert and change my dive plan a little bit from what I originally planned because since this rope's been cut, I'm not going to be get, be able to go down to the 60-foot section to locate those street signs. So it looks like that's going to be a video for a different day. I'll have to come out and I'll have to relocate them and run lines across and things like that. But since I am changing my dive plan, let's talk about what happens in a solo dive when you have to change your dive plan. Well, since I'm not going as deep as I originally planned and my dive's going to be cut a little bit shorter, then that's going to be okay. I can change my plan mid-dive as long as I change it and make it more conservative. You never want to make your dive more liberal. You want to make it always more conservative. Now, just because I'm changing a plan doesn't mean I've got to abort. It just means that I'm going to change it and not go as deep and stay as long as what I originally planned. Now we're coming up on the second sailboat that we've got sunk. This is what we call the shallow boat. And the cool thing about this one, uh, if you use the My SSI app and you go to the map feature on it, and you zoom into our facility, this is a dive site that is in the My Dive Guide program from the SSI uh, app. So it's really cool. You can actually go and find this boat on your My Dive Guide right now. So just bring up the app, go to the map, you can zoom in and you'll actually see this sailboat, which is really cool. We also usually have a couple resident catfish that hang out in the boat here. Um, they don't appear to be any in this boat right now, but it's pretty cool bringing open water students out here and they see a 25 to 30 pound catfish just kind of sitting there hanging out and staring at them. But I'm going to go ahead and head off to the bow of this boat, which is going to lead me over to what we call the workout room. And you'll see here briefly why we call it that. But I'm going to stop and do a quick little gas switch here. So what I'm going to do is take my uh, reel here for my surface buoy or my surface flag and i'm just going to kind of secure it i'm going to do a quick gas switch do everything that i need to do check my gauges hold nine yards and then of course i will pick up the reel again and continue on with the dive and yes this is a solo dive and i don't really have a buddy there to help me but i don't really want to change anything that i would normally do on any other dive I'm going to do my gas switches. I'm going to check my gas, you know, my air pressure, all that. I'm going to make sure my buoyancy is where it needs to be and that I'm holding trim. You know, solo diving is really no different than any other type of dive. There's just a lot of extra special considerations that you need to do in the planning stage and during the execution stage as well. But after we leave the uh, sailboat there, you'll see we're going to come up to a uh, treadmill. This is an old Norda Track treadmill. Couldn't really tell you how it got there, but it's there. And this is why we call this the workout room area. This way if divers, you know, want to work out when they're underwater, it gives them a great opportunity to do it. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to head over to now what's called the office. And as I'm coming up, you'll notice I am getting shallower. So I'm having to control my surface line as well or my surface float line and make sure I, I continue not to have any type of entanglements with it. But I'm going to go ahead and get it wound up, keep it nice and taut from the surface. And I'm going to head over to what we call the office. The office is nothing really fancy. It's just a old computer desk. It's got a computer on it. Looks like it's been knocked over here, so I'll have to get that restood back up one day. Uh, not a big deal for today. All I'm doing today is just, you know, doing observations, seeing what all is underwater. It needs to be repaired before the spring season hits uh, in the next few months. And I've got plenty of time to get this done. This is also going to be a two-man dive team. Uh, job if you will because it'll take two of us to get out there and rerun ropes and everything else so all i'm doing is just making notes and i can use this in the future as well so okay this is what i gotta fix so this is our next little junction point here and there's two ropes that come off this the uh, upper rope which is the one i'm going to take goes back to the main training platform the lower rope goes over to the secondary platform that we use 
whenever we are doing navigational runs and things like that. So I'm gonna take that upper rope. You'll see it takes me right back to the platform. And one thing you didn't get to see earlier, we actually got a basketball court set up on the back side of the platform, which is really cool. Uh, we used to have bowling balls in the water that you could shoot hoops with, but they seem to uh, continually get stolen and unfortunately you know you can't have nice things sometimes so we've never replaced the bowling balls underwater just because people keep taking them but i'm gonna go ahead and just do a uh, a quick inspection here of our platform make sure our it's still nice and secured uh, make sure there's nothing you know hazardous there for divers and then i'll move on to the next object as well So the next object that we're going to come to is another satellite dish. We actually got a total of three satellite dishes here in the water. Um, there's only two here on the playground area. But I'm going to head over to it, just make sure it's nice and secure. And most of these are stood up um, because they have the frame or the pole that originally would have been buried in the ground. They're just kind of laying on the bottom and kind of standing them up. So we want to make sure that the lines are nice and tall and that they're not going to move and cause a hazard. Because if a diver was swimming around the back, they hit this pole, you know, the possibility of it falling is kind of high. So what we do is we secure them up with an additional pole and kind of lock them into place. So as you can see, this one's standing up just fine. No worries there. The ropes kind of help them as well. But I'm going to go ahead and connect back into the front. And we are going to go ahead and head back over uh, to the main junction point, the vertical sea do real quick. Um, because as I head back in, since I am going to have a little bit extra time on this dive than what I initially had planned because I couldn't get over to the 60 foot area, uh, I'm gonna go do, or I'm gonna go search for another sailboat that's been sunk. And this is one that we are hoping to be able to salvage up and not for resale or for repair, but salvage up and move it to a better area um, because right now it's kind of in an overhead environment and we don't want a lot of our divers who are not trained in overhead environments to uh, be going in that overhead environment and diving on this sailboat. So as I'm heading back now, you'll see I picked that um, fishing lure back up and I'm going to go ahead and try to get it out of the water. But here's where I'm going to kind of branch off the line for a second and I'm going to get rid of my flag because I am going into an overhead environment and I want to make sure that I don't create an entanglement hazard and obviously I can't take that flag with me. So I'm going to go ahead and just secure it to the line so I don't lose it. And I'm going to hook up uh, a reel system to one of the poles here on the dock. And I want to take a few minutes and I want to talk about crossover training, what crossover training means. There's a lot of classes that you're going to take that has the exact same skill sets in it. Uh, whether it's, say, an advanced rec course or a cavern course or an ice diving course. And when I'm teaching, say, those three specific courses, a lot of people will say, well, I've already learned this skill and I learned it in this particular class. And you do. There's a lot of classes that teach the same skill sets for uh, different classes. And so you can use those skill sets. In this case, I'm using an overhead environment skill set in an open water environment. And that's the cool thing about taking these training courses. You get to learn all different types of skills that are gonna help you in all different types of situations. So basically what I'm doing is just taking my reel and I'm creating what's called a primary tie off here. And I'm just going to tie it or uh, latch my reel over to the pole. And then as I swim off using that reel, I can use this as a search technique. And maybe if I'm doing, say, a circle search or something like that. But I'm basically going to be using it as a primary and secondary tile so that I can get back to my exit point because I am going into an overhead environment. Yeah, I get it. It's an open water environment. It's a lake. But I'm going to be going up underneath the docks to try to find um, another sunken sailboat. So here I'm using... Uh, the secondary dock pole as my secondary tie off as well and that way if there's an issue i don't have to just pop up and there be a boat up above my head i can always find this line come back out to the open water portion and then um, come up safely but now i've got my primary tie off i've got my secondary tie off and i'm gonna swim on and we should be coming up to one of the newer sunken sailboats that miraculously showed up one day this year and we're hoping to get this boat salvaged very, very soon, uh, hopefully before the springtime season, and get it moved over to an area that's going to be a little bit better for divers to um, actually get out and dive on and enjoy their time. But here you can see I found the other boat, 
and I'm gonna go ahead and tie off my reel. I'm gonna do a quick inspection of it. And this just kind of tells me what I need to do um, when it comes time to lift up the boat, uh, how much lift I need, what a type of attachment points I need. And it also tells me the condition of the vessel on whether or not it's gonna even be able to, to be salvaged up. A lot of times boats that have been underwater for a very long time, they can break apart when you try to lift them up. And I don't think we're gonna have that issue with, with this particular one, but that is always a possibility. So having just a, a good idea of everything that I'm going to need whenever it does come time to lift this. Uh, I can use this time now to kind of do a quick inspection here just to see what's there. Another cool little fun fact about this vessel, I've actually dove it before and I've never marked it. I know from the surface where it's at, but I've never really marked it underwater. So by having that line, I can kind of get an overall picture and, you know, run a permanent line to it until we have the, the opportunity to actually lift it up. I'm going to go ahead and look inside. Now, I'm not going to penetrate this, but I'm going to look inside and make sure there, uh, there's nothing in there, no big fish or anything like that. There was quite a bit of wildlife on this boat. I saw quite a bit of largemouth bass. As this time of the year, you know, they, they still bite pretty good. Like I said earlier, there's a bass tournament going on right now. And so it was pretty cool seeing a lot of those. Right here, I've got one. You can see he kind of swims away. And I think I've got another one that scoots under me really quick. I think I spooked him a little bit. But plenty of wildlife, plenty of bryzoans all over this vessel. And like I said, the bryzoans lets, lets me know that we have a very healthy ecosystem and healthy waterway. I know it looks stingy. That's, that's typical for our lake. But just because it's stingy doesn't mean it's health, uh, not healthy. The bryzoans tells us that the waterway here is very, very healthy. And any of our local viewers that are watching this, I know we got a lot of fishermen that will catch fish and throw them back because they say they won't eat nothing out of the lake. Um, take it for what it's worth, but if we got this many bryzoans here in our area, like I said, it's a good telltale sign that we have a good, healthy waterway. Don't be afraid to catch and cook your fish. It's really good. I've ate fish out of this lake for, you know, my entire life, and I've, I've personally never had any issues with it. But I'm going to go ahead. I've got my reel back now, and I'm going to work my way back towards the exit point. So here is my secondary tie-off. I'm going to go ahead and um, unsecure my line here. And one of the things, if you're doing any type of overhead environment training, you want to make sure that you practice your line drills. Make sure that you're keeping that line taut the whole time because you can create an entanglement hazard very easily if you're not careful. I know with my cavern students, before we take them into a cavern, we'll always let them practice in a pool. And the pool that we use, we'll turn the lights out because a lot of times when you go into an overhead environment, you're not going to have a lot of light, especially in a cavern or a cave or something like that. And so we give them an ample amount of time to practice their line skills uh, in using flashlights and everything else. As you hear, you can see I'm using a canister light. I got it on a Goodman style handle, but that's something else that I've got to worry about. And I don't want to get everything entangled. So now that we've kind of worked our way back to our dive flag, we're going to go ahead and head over to the exit point. I am going to kind of give you some final thoughts here at the end, but guys, to be honest with you, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it very educational. I hope I've demystified some of the stuff that maybe your open water instructor talked about when it comes to solo diving. Solo diving is extremely dangerous but so is diving in general. And with the proper knowledge, skills, equipment, and experience, you can actually go solo diving and stay safe. But please make sure you get proper training before you do it. All right, guys, I'm out of the water, back up here on dry land. I just ran up to the store to get me a bite to eat real quick because uh, I'm starving after that dive. Let's talk about the dive itself real quick. I did have to cut it short. I initially planned a 60-foot dive with a total run time of 60 minutes. Um, I ended up only diving 30 minutes. I wasn't able to get down to the 60-foot depth uh, to where our street signs are simply because the rope had been cut and I couldn't find the rope. So that's going to be for a dive for a different day of how I get out there and find that and reattach it. But uh, all in all, it was a good dive. I made a dive plan. I executed the dive plan. I did change it mid-dive, but I changed it to be more conservative than what it was originally. So yeah, it was a really, really good dive. I just sent my wife a text to let her know that I was out of the water. I also called my dive master and said, hey, I'm out of the water. You don't have to worry about me anymore. But all in all, this was a very, very fun dive. It was a very relaxing dive, and I got a lot done. Got to see a lot of new ecologies out there. Uh, got to see the healthiness of the water, if you will with all the bryzoans i got to check some of the ropes i cleaned up a little bit of the trash that was around i got the fish hooks out of the line stuff like that but yeah it was a really good dive 
I really hope this video was educational to you guys. And speaking of education, I might be an SSI instructor trainer and solo diving instructor, but I'm not your SSI instructor trainer or solo diving instructor. You need to seek out a local SSI solo diving instructor and make sure that you get properly trained before you ever attempt to go out and do something like this. This wasn't a very hard dive. This was 26 foot. I think it was the max depth I was able to get to. Um, and it was only for 30 minutes. We all do that in the tropics. We even do it here in your local lakes and things like that. But you usually have a buddy. So before you get out there and do something like this, please seek out proper training. If your local SSI instructor doesn't teach this, then give SSI a call. Heck, give us a call. We'll try to find one that's close to you. Um, you know, worst case scenario, you can come out here and we can train you how to do this. Because I really hope you did enjoy the video. If you did, give me a big thumbs up. Definitely share this video as well. If you got any questions on solo diving, please put it down in the comment section below. I'll try to get to it as quickly as I can and answer it just as thoroughly as I can as well. And hopefully this will demystify some of the things that you were taught about solo diving. But guys, as always, make sure you follow us on Instagram and Twitter, like us on Facebook, pin us on Pinterest, subscribe to us here on YouTube. And as always, guys, we appreciate you.